did COVID-19 start and why does it matter? Some analysts say it's a political blame game between big power rivals, but scientists aren't interested in that at all. They say that it's important to find out so that the world can try and prevent this terrible type of pandemic from ever happening again. Wuhan came into focus because it was there that the virus was first detected. And the speculations range from the sober that it's possible that it came from normal investigations into infectious diseases, right through to conspiracy theories that say it was bioengineered in a military lab. So what's the truth? Dr. Somya Swaminathan, welcome to In Conversation. Thank you very much. Pleasure to be with you. How did COVID-19 start and why does it matter? So it's possible that this virus could have come directly from a bat to a human. We know bats are reservoirs of many, many, many coronaviruses. It could have come through an intermediate host, some animal, wild animal or domesticated animal. We're not sure. Um, there are other hypotheses on the table that the WHO team that went to China uh, in February 21, uh, put out there, and one was an accidental leak. We know that accidents happen in labs. They happened in the past. They can happen again. And so that theory also needs to be looked at. And why is it important? So that we can take steps to prevent the next pandemic. Because we've had more frequent pandemics over the last few decades, and that's because animals and humans are coming closer together as we are encroaching into their space where cutting down forests, they're urbanizing them. There seems, though, to be a bit of a confusion because I have the impression that when the WHO talks about a lab leak, that you're actually referring to something which might have happened as an accident during the normal course of studying infectious diseases. Whereas if you are a conspiracy theory person, you're thinking of it as being a mad scientist in a lab genetically engineering something to be infectious to people as a bioweapon. That's a pretty different scenario. Very different. And I don't think there's been any evidence at all uh, of this conspiracy theory that it was a specially created virus that was then let loose uh, on people. Uh, but the accidental laboratory leak could occur from a lab that's, you know, doing research on coronaviruses that, that has these viruses that scientists are working and on. And this is normal research. Normal research, exactly. And if at some point that uh, comes out of, of course, it's done very carefully. This kind of research uh, is done in BSL-3 and BSL-4, you know, super secure labs. But as I said, accidents can happen once in a while. And it would be important to determine if uh, this was the case or not. Why is it important to know whether it went from a wild animal to a human directly, or whether it went through, let's say, one wild animal and then another animal and then to us? What difference does that make at all? It's important because it affects a lot of our uh, behavior and practices. So, for example, if it was a direct infection from bats, most likely it would have happened when human beings have come into contact with bats, you know, uh, as part of their occupation. We need to be careful in the future of how we interact uh, with bats, and there may be some professions that have to take special precautions. If, on the other hand, it transmitted through an intermediate uh, animal, and we know that this virus actually infects quite a lot of animals like ferrets and uh, hamsters and minks and, you know, even tigers and lions and uh, domestic cats, all have been known to be uh, infected. So if indeed it came through one of these uh, animals, then it's telling us more about, you know, how we deal with these animals in terms of if they're farming them, if it's an animal that's farmed, then we have to take uh, 
certain kinds of precautions, maybe some kind of a screening like we do for influenza, you know, for avian influenza and, and, and swine flu and so on. Uh, it's also about how you operate markets uh, and the wet markets particularly. So this is why there was a lot of interest in the, uh, in the market itself, the wet market in Wuhan to see if that could have been a place where this originated. So I think, and if it's a lab leak, of course, then your biosafety precautions and things need to be re-looked at. And uh, we need to be even stronger in our, uh, in our biosafety. But that's very different from, let's say, a political blame game where you're trying to say that, you know, the Chinese authorities released this into the environment and, you know, infected everybody and infected the world. Absolutely. And I think politics has absolutely no place in this um, because the science behind this is going to be important for all of us, regardless of which country we live in. This kind of research is done in many countries around the world. Um, and, uh, you know, the kind of, uh, we've, we've talked about other zoonotic infections which originated from the forests in Africa and then infected human beings. So this can happen anywhere. And that's, it's, so it's, it's a global learning that needs to take place. And that's why we need a global scientific effort, which is far removed from politics, which is credible, which is data and evidence-based, and that informs us. On, on the steps that all countries should be taking to prevent this kind of thing from happening again. What about those who say that because it costs the world so much that we do need to find who is responsible? I think that's probably not the right question to be asking as to who is responsible, because if this were a natural phenomenon, it can happen anywhere. It's happened in different parts of the world in the past. It can happen tomorrow in anywhere, you know, the next pandemic could be upon us even before we're out of this one. But the more data that's disclosed, obviously, the better. Absolutely, yes. Transparency is critical because without seeing the real data, this is true for anything, right? If there's a new vaccine that someone says is very effective, well, without seeing the data, we cannot make any kind of uh, assessment. So it's the same thing here. We need the data. We need more studies to be done. Uh, Chinese scientists have already done quite a lot of background work, but there needs to be extensive studies done, you know, really looking back actually before the first case in December of 2019 and trying to go back to find out if there's any evidence of this virus circulating either in humans or in animals, wild animals, etc. So there's a, a number of things which need to be done and can only be done, of course, with uh, the cooperation uh, of the Chinese scientists and the Chinese government. So the Chinese authorities and Chinese scientists, should they be disclosing more? Well, the way it worked in, um, in February 2021 was a, a joint exercise where there was an international team that actually went to China and worked with the local scientists there. And I think that's the right approach. That's the approach that we would definitely like to pursue with a very open and transparent. And again, I think it's worked like that in the past. So we need to take the politics away completely from this and just let the scientists get on with their job. But if you could have a lab leak from one of these infectious disease centers, why don't we just shut them down? Would that be safer? If you shut down all the laboratories, I think things would be much worse because you'd know nothing. You would be blind. You'd be flying blind. You wouldn't know what the virus was, where it came from, what its genetic sequence was. You wouldn't be able to make vaccines and drugs. So no, I think the answer is not to shut them down, but to run them safely and responsibly.
The Delta variant is much, much more infectious. Does that mean that all variants are going to be more dangerous to humans? That's a very good question. And as you know, we're tracking the changes in this virus. And uh, SARS-CoV-2, like other RNA viruses, keeps on changing or what we call mutating and evolving changes in its genome over a period of time. And the more it replicates, the more it transmits, the more likely it is to keep on accumulating these changes. So at the moment, we have four variants of concern, the alpha, beta, gamma, and delta. What we are really worried is that there will be more that emerge because the virus is going wild in many parts of the world just now. And we can't predict if we will get a variant that's either more transmissible or that becomes resistant to the currently available vaccines. Uh, that would be disastrous, of course, and we have to hope that doesn't happen and we have to do everything possible to keep the virus from replicating as much as it is currently in order to reduce the chances of these new variants. So if I understand you correctly, if we also allow there to be more replications and as more people get infected, more get sick from it, we're actually then having a breeding ground for more variants, which potentially could be dangerous to us. So that's why we really have to try and keep infection levels as low as possible. Exactly, exactly. And that's why the WHO has been saying, first of all, that in addition to vaccinations, we need to maintain the other public health and social measures and the personal behaviors, the mask wearing, the physical distancing, the hand hygiene, that we know are effective in reducing transmission. So it's vaccines plus all of these other things. And that we need to get vaccines out around the world, all countries, to all those vulnerable people out there so that we can prevent those people from getting sick and dying. Because right now, there are about 10,000 people dying every day of, of this viral infection, and that should be unacceptable. You talked about vaccine resistance and about how dangerous and tragic that would be. So the virus's natural tendency is to try to survive and be effective in infecting others. And in fact, in a way, we are lucky that this virus actually mutates much less than a virus like the HIV, for example, that every day is accumulating hundreds of mutations. So the chances of, of a, a variant developing that's resistant to vaccines is theoretically possible because especially as vaccinated people in the population increase, the virus is going to encounter some immunity. And it might then try to overcome that immunity uh, by changing itself. But I think the kind of immunity that people are getting, both from natural infection and from vaccines, is quite broad. It, uh, it's, it's priming both the cell-mediated immune system and the humoral immunity. So we have different arms of the immune system that are getting primed. And so hopefully that immunity should be enough to at least uh, prevent severe disease from uh, any new variants that emerge, just as it has been effective against the variants that we currently have. If we look at the Delta variant, it's much more infectious, but is it more deadly? So there's mixed evidence on this. I mean, there are many countries where the Delta variant took hold, caused these explosive outbreaks, and you saw huge numbers flooding into the hospitals. Now, that's also a function of the number of people who get infected, because we know that while in the majority of cases, the infection is mild and you know doesn't lead to severe illness or need hospitalization, in about 5 to 10% of cases, it does. And so if you have that many more people getting infected, you see that many more in the hospital, including younger people. So it gives the impression that this is more uh, virulent, more severe virus, but it may not be the case. Um, so I think the consensus is that the Delta variant doesn't cause significantly different uh, type of a clinical profile. Some of the symptoms might vary a little bit, it, you know, might be causes more of headache and upper respiratory symptoms initially, but more or less it's the same pattern that, that we've been seeing. What about booster shots? The rich countries, at least, are beginning to talk about booster shots. This is obviously a hot topic. Now, I believe that we should stick with the data, stick with the science. What we want to know is 
are we going to need boosters? And if so, when and where and how are we going to need these boosters? Is it going to be just for a group of people, the elderly, for example, above 65 or above 70? Is it going to be after one year or two years? Is it going to be only for certain variants that need higher levels of uh, antibodies? And are different vaccines going to behave differently? We know that we have inactivated vaccines, we have viral vector vaccines, we have the mRNA vaccines. We're still learning because it's very early, we, you know, only eight months after we've started using these vaccines. So we believe it's premature just now to talk about boosting because we are not there with the science. We still need more data. We need these studies. And if we preempt that by announcing boosters too early, then it will be very hard to walk that policy back. young children be vaccinated? So in, in the case of children, I think the really good thing about this pandemic has been the children, especially young children, while they can get infected uh, almost as easily as adults, they have not had the kind of clinical disease that we've seen in adults. For children under 12, yes, there are studies going on, but at this point, we're not really uh, at the point where we're recommending these vaccines. One is we're waiting for the data, but secondly, I think every uh, the WHO will certainly look at this. We have the expert advisory group on immunization, SAGE, that weighs the benefits and the risks. Uh, and every country would do that, actually. And it depends a lot on your local epidemiological situation as well. When do you think we will have good enough data so that WHO will make a recommendation for children under 12, whether they should be vaccinated or not? We will have some data definitely by the end of this year on children under 12 because there are studies going on and uh, some of them are close to completion. What the WHO is recommending now is that adolescents with underlying illnesses and comorbidities who are especially uh, vulnerable to severe disease should get the vaccines, uh, those that have been approved. Uh, and so I think we should start with children who have these underlying uh, illnesses and give them uh, priority. The other thing, of course, is that we're still far away from vaccinating the high-risk adult groups, uh, the frontline workers, healthcare workers, the elderly. In many countries, you know, we haven't even covered that group. So the priority would be to, to do that first, hopefully by the end of the year, try to cover at least 30, 40% of the uh, population of every country. And then we can start thinking about children in 2022, by which time we will have more data as well. And the epidemiology could have changed. Maybe we will bring down transmission enough by then that we don't have to worry so much. So we're not talking about children being the potentially, so to say, hidden infection pool uh, for all the rest of us. No, because once you cut down transmission in adults, you're going to affect uh, this. You know, we saw last year that in many countries which had closed schools, um, infection in children still continued. And so it wasn't that children were bringing infection into households. They were getting infected and of course they were passing it on to others. But it was really because they were part of families and communities. So I think if you protect a large portion of the adults, you're definitely going to drive transmission down to the point where this may become irrelevant. When do you think the pandemic will end, at least from the point of view of a normal person? 
I wish it was sooner than later. And I think it, a lot depends again on our own actions. It's really in our hands. Today, we have the vaccine supplies globally to be able to distribute them around the world equitably, particularly to those countries which are still have a huge burden of disease and deaths. We know, as I said today, eight to 10,000 deaths every day. High priority is to stop those deaths that can be done with vaccines. So if we do that, we focus on doing that over the next couple of months, get all the vaccines out to places which have not vaccinated their most vulnerable. Then we get into the phase of vaccinating adults, all adults. So we're trying to achieve some sort of a population high immunity level. This definitely will dampen down the transmission. Um, then that's when we're looking at this virus becoming a sort of an endemic respiratory viruses. We live with many others, uh, coronaviruses. We have you know, other respiratory viruses, uh, influenza, of course. We do accept some amount of sickness uh, and death, though I must say that in the last year and a half, influenza hasn't shown up at all in any part of the world. So this is also an important lesson for us. We've done things which have banished influenza. So it's the mask wearing, the distancing, you know, the, the respiratory hygiene that we've all become used to. So we could potentially reduce the burden of respiratory viral infections year after year. We don't have to accept the high number of deaths due to flu that we are used to. But isn't it also in our hands, Dr. Somya, that we need to also as individuals make choices? You're absolutely right. I think it's in the hands of every citizen. All of us can speak up and can do what we can. Um, to also, because politicians also respond to what their citizens are saying. And so if there is, if they see this, uh, this call from their own citizens saying, well, we're vaccinated now, let's go and help others. This is also going to make a big difference. Dr. Somya Swaminathan, thank you very much for being on In Conversation. Thank you so much, it's a pleasure.